The next topic we're going to discuss is the functional groups known as ethers. So we just finished up talking about alcohols, uh, which as we noted, um, can be viewed as a derivative of water where one of the hydrogens is replaced with an organic group. And ethers are sort of the next step up where now both of the hydrogens of water are replaced with organic groups. So we're going to spend um, a little bit of time talking about uh, ethers um, and some of their um, chemistry, which um, actually turns out to be uh, relatively limited um, in comparison to alcohols. Um, so for example, just like water and alcohols, ethers are weakly basic, meaning that they can be protonated. Um, and you can see that the pKa of protonated diethyl ether here is, is uh, minus 3.5. So uh, ethers are only very weakly basic, but they are um, in fact basic. Um, but uh, ethers lacking that proton on the oxygen um, are much more limited in um, some of the other chemistries that we've come to consider with alcohols. Um, so things like oxidation or uh, deprotonation uh, to do certain types of nucleophilic attack are just much more limited with ethers um, because they lack that proton. Um, but that does give them a stability um, that serves an important structural role in many cases. So we can just consider um, some of uh, the, the more common ethers or, or where do we see ethers um, in important molecules. Um, and so one of the simplest and most widespread ethers is diethyl ether, um, which is so common it's actually often just referred to as ether. Um, so you might use ether um, in a variety of ways. Um, it, interestingly, historically, ether was um, once used as an anesthetic. Right? So this is one of the first ways that um, surgeons or, or doctors had to um, anesthetize patients so that they wouldn't feel the extraordinary pain of surgery. It's certainly been replaced by more modern, modern uh, chemicals, but um, it, it was one of the first. Um, now, uh, diethyl ether is um, typically used mostly as a solvent, um, both in the laboratory um, and on an industrial uh, scale. Uh, interestingly, ether isn't too toxic. I mean, in fact, you can actually ingest uh, small quantities of it. Um, I certainly don't recommend it, um, and it sounds disgusting to me, um, but I found this on Wikipedia where um, apparently uh, drinking ether was, uh, used to be quite popular among Polish peasants. Um, and apparently is still uh, done somewhat today. And you can see here, they, they say that it's usually consumed in small quantities, poured over milk, uh, water with sugar, or even with orange juice. Um, so again, I, I definitely don't recommend this, but apparently this is, uh, this is done by people. Um, historically, uh, diethyl ether was known as sweet oil of vitriol. So uh, this actually derives from the way that it's prepared or was prepared. You take ethanol, which uh, you know could be uh, obtained simply from fermentation, um, and you treat it with a little bit of sulfuric acid and heat, and you get diethyl ether out, which can be distilled away. And it turns out that the historical name for sulfuric acid was actually vitriol. So you might actually know the word vitriol um, as referring to a very sort of um, cruel and biting criticism. Um, so, so if you're you're spitting vitriol at someone, um, you you might also say that. Uh, you know, your, uh, his uh, criticism was very acidic. Um, and that's, uh, this actually comes from, from a very strong acid. So anyway, uh, that's vitriol. And then the sweet oil, the ether that you get out, um, actually has a, a relatively uh, sweet flavor. So um, if, you, if you take your ethanol and you do this reaction, you can actually get that sweet oil of vitriol. Uh, and then you can go ahead and, um, you know, engage in some of this ether drinking, I suppose. Well, we see ethers in, in other cases too, though, and one of the um, interesting aspects of ethers is that because they have the two organic substituents, those substituents can also be connected. So an ether functionality can actually be part of a ring. And here we see a very uh, simple example um, of a cyclic ether known as tetrahydrofuran. Right? So it's just a five-membered ether, um, an example of a cyclic ether. Um, so again, THF is very often used as a solvent um, in the laboratory. Um, and it's also used in certain products, uh, so things like varnishes um, will include a, a solvent like THF. Um, but by far the largest um, commercial application of THF is that it actually can be polymerized with strong acid uh, to get this type of polymer, which is called polytetrahydrofuran. Um, and again, this is used in many uh, circumstances, but one of the largest um, applications is uh, in making spandex. Right? So this, this actually goes into the production of uh, that very familiar uh, uh, material uh, that, that we know of. 
Well, other uh, cases where you, uh, molecules you might know um, that incorporate ethers. So one is methyl terbutyl ether, or uh, more commonly known as MTBE. So this has long been used as a gas additive, as an anti-knock agent. Um, it has some environmental concerns, um, but it still is in, in use. Um, and basically help to replace um, lead. So you see unleaded gasoline, and this is one of the chemicals that helps makes that possible. Uh, we also see this in naturally occurring substances. So here's the structure of tetrahydrocannabinol, or otherwise known as THC. And this is the principal psychoactive component of marijuana. And you can see right here in the center, there is this uh, cyclic ether um, that's in that oxygen as part of an um, a, a aromatic system. And uh, drugs as well, medicines. So here's the structure of Tamiflu, uh, which you might know if you start to feel the flu symptoms, you can go get a dose of Tamiflu and, and ward off much of the, um, the bad effects of the flu. And you can see here, there is a, a nice ether linkage um, where one side of the ether is connected to this whole complex ring and then the other side is just simply a, a pentane substituent. We well, can see here uh, that you know you can have an ether that's attached to either an, an aliphatic substituent or an aromatic, um, and in fact, um, many uh, ethers are going to be part of aromatic systems. So here's a, a structure of anisole. We've actually talked about this one before. Um, this is a common uh, and very simple aromatic ether. Um, it has the smell of anise, as the name probably suggests, and anisol is actually used, um, it's derivatized to many different uh, materials that are used as uh, um, flavorings and, and, um, and for, uh, uh, you know, uh, smell uh, components um, in different products. Um, vanillin is an example that uh, also has a, a aromatic ether. Um, so here's a structure. You can see there's an aldehyde, a phenol, and now this uh, aromatic ether um, functional groups in this molecule. And this is the major component of vanilla. This is what gives vanilla its vanilla uh, character, um, and whether that's extracted from the natural vanilla bean or uh, synthesized in the laboratory. If you buy imitation vanilla, uh, you're basically buying uh, synthetic vanillin. And in fact, you can also have ethers that um, both of the substituents are going to be aromatic. So here's a very simple diphenyl ether. Um, and this turns out to apparently have the smell of geraniums. Um, I actually have never verified that myself, um, but apparently it smells quite pleasant um, and is actually uh, used often in things like soaps. Now, one of the most interesting classes of ethers um, are uh, a group of molecules known as the crown ethers. Um, so these actually turn out to be very strong and very selective binders of cations. Uh, so this work actually resulted in a Nobel Prize um, in chemistry uh, for Charles Peterson. Um, and I show the structure of three of the more common crown ethers. And you can see they basically look like, um, or you know, they, they somewhat look like crowns. Um, and basically what they are is polyethers that are tied up in a ring. Uh, and uh, so depending on the size of the crown ether, you get different selectivities for different cations. Right, so the 12 crown four, um, and, and by the way, the, the naming system goes, the first number 12 is how many atoms are in the ring. And then this last um, number is how many oxygen atoms there are. So 12 crown four has 12 atoms with four oxygens. 12 crown four is selective for binding to lithium cations. Um, 15 crown 5 has a, a selectivity for sodium, and then 18 crown 6 is highly selective for the potassium cation. Um, and, and so that's actually incredibly interesting that, that uh, even though lithium, sodium, and potassium um, are, are oftentimes viewed as being very similar in their chemistry, and they are, um, the, the idea that you can actually separate these out by selectively binding to one is pretty uh, remarkable. And the way that this works, so I show a molecular model here of 18 crown 6 bound to a potassium cation. And what happens is the lone pairs from each of the oxygens in the crown ether will coordinate with the positive cation. And that in itself provides a very strong stabilizing um, interaction. Um, but then based on the size of the ring, a certain cation is going to uh, fit uh, either you know, more or less well in there. And so in the case of 18 crown 6, as you can see, the ionic radius of the um, potassium uh, cation um, basically exactly fits the hole that is created by the crown ether. And so um, all of those uh, oxygen lone pairs um, binding to the cation, in addition to the perfect size fit, um, gives you this incredibly stable um, and selective binding of potassium. And here I think you can really see the analogy to the crown where if this was the head, 
um, the, the crown ether then goes on top. So why are these useful? Well, uh, one uh, way that, that uh, crown ethers are used uh, very commonly is in uh, reactions. So imagine you have an anion um, that has a potassium counter ion. So something like potassium terputoxide. So to a certain degree, the potassium is helping to stabilize the anion on, the, on that uh, alkoxide. Now, potassium isn't great at stabilizing negative charge, but it does to a certain extent, okay? But what happens if you were to throw in um, 18 crown six into potassium terputoxide, the 18 crown six binds to the potassium and it basically um, completely removes its ability to stabilize the alkoxide, right? And so this will oftentimes be um, said or referred to as uh, the, this being now a naked anion, right? Because it, it no longer has its stabilizing counterpart. It feels in many ways like it's lost its counter ion and that makes it very unhappy. It's going to uh, it's going to try to, to uh, react uh, to to uh, you know remove that anionic charge um, much more readily than it would uh, before the potassium was bound. And so, simply throwing in an 18 crown six to a reaction like this can um, massively accelerate um, whatever that anion is doing. Um, so, for in this example, you would expect much greater reactivity from that terputoxide um, on the right hand of this equation than on the left. The last one that I want to uh, talk about in terms of, of ethers, um, actually a, a class of naturally occurring um, ether molecules, um, and this actually is uh, related to what's known as the red tide. Uh, so I don't know if you've heard about this, but this is something that can happen um, in, in the ocean, and it's basically caused by uh, these uh, what are called algal blooms, or these uh, massive uh, blooms of dinoflagellates. Uh, um, and oftentimes these are going to have a brownish or a reddish color, as you can see from these, these very striking uh, images here. Um, it almost looks uh, biblical in nature. Um, if you've ever heard of red tide, you know that it's uh, potentially toxic and you're, you certainly aren't supposed to go swimming in a red tide, um, but you also need to avoid eating shellfish um, that have been around a red tide. And the reason is, is because these di dinoflagellates um, will produce uh, very toxic molecules that the shellfish um, will uh, concentrate and then if you eat the shellfish you're going to eat these molecules. Um, and one of the uh, biggest culprits here are the, the brevitoxins. So I show one of the molecules here, brevitoxin B. Um, uh, this is a, a very, uh, very uh, potent um, neurotoxin um, and it's uh, this class of molecules is known as the ladder polyethers. So you can see there's all of these ethers fused together in this long chain. So there's 11 total in brevitoxin B. And you can see it sort of, uh, you know, sort of invokes a ladder um, type of, of idea here. Um, but anyway, pretty remarkable looking molecules just for the number of ethers that are involved in the number of stereocenters. Um, uh, and so the brevitoxins are responsible for what's called neurotoxic shellfish poisoning that comes from red tide. Um, and the way that these molecules work without going into too much detail is that they actually will bind to the sodium channels of neurons and uh, it, it basically binds to the sodium channel and keeps them held open so then all of the the sodium atoms can rush through and basically depolarize the membrane and if you don't have that uh, that uh, you know ionic gradient across the membrane of your neurons the neurons can't fire and so basically this leads to complete paralysis um, if, you, uh, if you ingest uh, any of these types of molecules. So pretty bad. Um, now, uh, what's uh, interesting about the brevitoxins um, is uh, one of the things that's interesting is their uh, proposed biosynthesis. Um, so, you know, it's, you could consider how, how does nature make something that complicated? Um, and the best guess here is something that's called the Nakanishi hypothesis. So Koji Nakanishi is a pioneer in the study of um, natural products and, and how they're formed. Um, he's actually a emeritus professor here at Columbia. Um, and what he proposed was that these ladder polyethers um, are formed by first, the organism builds up a long chain of many alkenes, such as this molecule here. Then through a series of enzymes, uh, most of those uh, alkenes will be epoxidized to lead you to this polyepoxide type of material. And then in kind of the key step, the idea is that this carboxylate gets deprotonated by some base, uh, probably a, uh, you know, a, a group in an, in an enzyme. That carboxylate then will attack the first epoxide, 
and then that resulting elk oxide will attack another epoxide and so on and so forth all down the chain until you've built up this polyether. Um, and so um, that's a pretty interesting hypothesis and uh, you know there's evidence that this is probably actually the way that this occurs. So it's pretty interesting. Now there's a whole number of these uh, ladder polyethers uh, and we won't go through most of them but I did want to show you the granddaddy of them all uh, which is a molecule called mitotoxin. You can see that this is an absolutely gigantic molecule um, with what I believe is 32 uh, different ether rings, um, an absolutely enormous number of stereocenters, um, and even some interesting functionality like a couple of sulfonate uh, groups hanging off there. A truly spectacularly big molecule. Um, I show here uh, a space-filling model of what this molecule looks like. like it sort of has this weird uh, curving shape. Um, and this turns out to be one of the most toxic substances known to man. Um, so the LD50, the lethal dose, um, uh, is, uh, has been reported to be 50 nanograms per kilogram in mice. Um, so this, uh, if no other reason, is, is why you want to avoid uh, red tide and any shellfish that have been involved in the red tide. Okay, so in the next video we're going to talk a little bit about the properties and chemistry of ethers.